Thank you, Marilyn. Good morning, everybody. <coughs> I'm hoping my voice will last long enough for me to preach a decent sermon for a change. But yesterday was Veterans Day. And my intentions were to develop a message concerning the veterans that have given so much to us. And as I worked on that and kept working on it, uh, my mind kept being pulled away from that particular subject for a couple of reasons. But I don't want to discredit what the veterans have done. I, I, I think uh, we all have a debt that we owe to the veterans. Uh, I have talked to several of our veterans that have this post-traumatic syndrome, whatever that may be. Post-traumatic stress syndrome. Stress syndrome. And uh, in fact, Ruth has a, a high school friend who is married uh, to uh, one of the couples, and Victor is one of, uh, has become a friend of mine. But Victor has a real rough time with what he has, has to deal with waking up in the middle of the night, screaming at the top of his voice for fear that, uh, uh, what, uh, that he was being attacked. Uh, last time I had Ruth up at uh, the Charleston Medical uh, Center up there, uh, the uh, Charleston Area Medical Center, uh, I talked to a man up there that had the post, and he had to move post-medical, traumatic medical stress syndrome. Uh, and he had to move up in the country get rid of all the guns he had in, uh, in his place. He says, when I want to go hunting, I have to get my guns from my son, who well, has the uh, guns there. But he, had a, he, he says, I'm almost a hermit because of it. And it, it's terrible. And there are many, many people that have lost their lives. And I, I, I think back over the veterans. In fact, I had a cousin, a very close cousin, uh, who uh, his body has never been found from the uh, Second World War, and uh, I don't think there's a family in the United States that has not been affected by that. But one of the problems I had with this, and I, I hope you understand, is that every time I sat down and started working on a sermon dealing with uh, honoring our veterans and giving them the place of honor that they rightfully own, uh, I found myself going back to actually doing one of the lessons that's in the study course that we're going to be coming up at 10 o'clock, building upon the American heritage. And I thought, well, I don't want to become redundant. Uh, I, I want to find something new. And that, that course is so tremendously involved with our relationships as Americans that uh, I just didn't want to I take away from that. Then something happened last Monday that caused my mind to be really, really concentrating on uh, something else, another area. That uh, Ruth had surgery last Monday morning, and uh, she's having problems with it, a little bit soreness and so forth, and I didn't understand. Uh, but after she got out of surgery, she uh, uh, wanted to go to Waffle House. You know, that's Ruth and I's favorite place to eat. And uh, we went to Waffle House. And as we were sitting down and uh, uh, ordering our food, a young lady came up to me and said, do you mind if I ask you a question? She knew I was a preacher. Uh, in fact, I had talked to her several times about coming to church here. Uh, and uh, uh, I said, no, oh, go ahead and ask any question you want. And sometimes that, that opens the door to sometimes I get worried about it. <laughs> then uh, I, I figured it was going to be a, a church with any question. And she said, I don't have time right now. I'll come back. So about 15, 20 minutes later, she came over. So I looked at, uh, and looked at me and said, Phil, do you think we're living in the end time? And I got thinking about that. Are we living in the end time? My answer was real quick that I, I don't know. 
I said, down through the years, people have always thought that their lifetime, the way the world was, that was coming to the end time. And, but somehow the world has endured. Whether this time is the end time or not, that's God's business, not mine. I said, but if you want to ask me personally, uh, uh, my own personal opinion, rather than a scriptural answer, I would have to say I do agree with you that we're living in the end time. Now, I want you to be honest with yourself. I am confident that every one of you, when you have listened to the news at times, have thought about your thoughts, how long will God tolerate this before he sends Christ back to the world? Am I right? You've all thought about it. And the question is, uh, are we living in a time that things can't get any worse and Jesus is coming back again? Now, I didn't preface my answer to Adriana, or I didn't preface it, I added to it, that we're either living in the end time or we're going to see one of the greatest revivals that this world has ever seen. And people are going to turn from their wicked ways to God. I thought that was going to happen when, at 9-11. When you saw such an uh, uprising of people, but in few churches that were as small as we are, were starting to have church, uh, people coming to church just because of the fact they were concerned about what was happening in our nation. The more I thought about this, the more I began to think about uh, the end time. I'm, I'm have a thought about several scriptures that really, really motivated me this past week. And I, I want you to think in the line, line that I was thinking. First of all, I, I want to say that their end time theology seems to be one of the things that you hear over and over and over again if you listen to the television programs that are on the religious stations. It seems to be a thing that the preachers want to talk about. Uh, I, I have heard theories about the things that's going to happen about the end time that, uh, that range from the ridiculous to the sublime. In fact, some of the theories that I have heard, uh, you might say, edge upon the idea of science fiction. And sometimes I, I think this is where Star Trek gets some of the ideas that they have when they're presenting their purpose of I'm tracking. I, I don't, I, I'm going to make a statement that you might thoroughly disagree with what I'm going to say right now. Uh, this is a Phil Faust opinion. I think when it comes to the second coming of Christ, the things that are going to happen at the end time, that the Bible is relatively silent about most of these things. It says very little about them. In fact, many of the scriptures that are used in emphasis of teaching about the end times have already been fulfilled sometime in the past. And unless there's double fulfillment of those particular prophecies, I think we're wrong for applying them to the things about the second coming of Christ and the end of time. And the second thought that comes to my mind, and I hope you agree with me on this one. Well, the things about the end time are important. And don't get me wrong, I think they are important. But I cannot begin to question or begin to fully understand the idea of what God intends to do in the future and what He intends to do. That's the mind of God. My concern is what I'm going to be doing at present in preparation for that which God's going to do in the future. I don't know how many of you remember the story I told about my missing front tooth. I think I might have told it here before. You might not have been here. 
about how a coffee mug hit me in the face. What it was, my brother and I were, uh, during the Depression years, my mother had to work. My dad was on Youngstown Ohio, and lived, uh, we were living in Pittsburgh, and he had a job down there. You know, I came home about every other week, or maybe every three weeks. And my, my brother and I had the responsibility of the dishes. I still do the dishes. I always did with my help my wife out with, by doing that. And my, I was over washing the dishes because it was my turn to wash the dishes according to the uh, schedule that my mother set up. And my brother, who was a year and a half older than I was, kept sitting over across the room from me. You know, Look at the sissy doing the dishes. I think I've told you this before. So when he was drying the dishes, which was his responsibility, I went over and stood in the same place and I said, Look at the sissy drying the dishes. And he picked up a big coffee mug and then just a little bit of humor, a little bit of jest, not an anger, not an anger, me, me, me. He took it and tossed it and said, Here, catch. And rather than catch him, there was a day bed behind me, and I ducked him, so it would have landed on the day bed. The typical Phil Faust, I ducked right into the half of that cuff and hit me right in the mouth. My mother came home from work, and I talked like this from her after the night. That weekend, my dad was supposed to be coming home, and the very, my mom was saying, was the same, wait till your dad gets here, and I'm going to tell him what happened. Dad always got off the bus down at the front of the, the street we lived on. And we always sat on the porch and we waited for him to come when we knew he was coming. And we would race, my brother and I would race to see which one would get to Dad first. He always won. That particular weekend, I was not there. I was afraid of Dad coming. I, 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 I even hid from Dad, so Dad would not even see me because I was afraid of what he might do because I had, and I was my adult tooth that I got knocked out. And sometimes I think we look at the second coming of Christ in that particular manner. I've been a bad boy, I've been a bad girl, and I don't want Christ to come. But what should we be doing? Because Christ is coming back again. Four scriptures come to my mind. I'm going to share all four with you. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, Peter deals with those individuals that were questioning the second coming of Christ. Where is his coming? Where is the promise of his coming? All things remain as they always have been, and therefore, when is he going to come back again? They were ridiculed. By the way, I've heard people ridiculed today, too. And Peter answered that and said, Not all things were written, have been always remained the same. He talks about the creation, he talks about uh, the flood, and so forth. And he deals with the idea of, of, of the fact that Jesus Christ is going to come back again. <coughs> Listen to what he says in 2 Peter, the third chapter. Verses 10 through 11. But the day of the Lord, talking about the second coming, will come as a thief in the night. We don't know when it's going to come. In the which heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. By the way, I've always said that the evolutionist has it wrong. The earth didn't begin with a big bang, it's going to end with a big bang. It's going to fervent, uh, uh, the great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. And notice what he says in the 11th verse. He asked the question. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Because the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night, and you don't know when it's going to come. What 
of a verse above it, and ought you to be. Down in the 14th verse of the same chapter, he says, Wherefore be it beloved, seeing that we look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in him in peace, without spot and blemish. It's hard. That's hard. Is there one of my list this morning that can say that I have been perfect all week long and never thought about that thing, none of that thing? If you tell me that you have been perfect last week, then we'll tell you that's your fault for this week. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we need to be without spot and blemish. The only way that we can do that is through praying and confessing our sins to God. Another passage of scripture that comes to my mind is the 22nd, 24th chapter of the uh, book of Matthew. Oh, this is a chapter that is uh, thrives in these end time preachers that are trying to say, oh, look at all these things that are happening. But if you look at the very first of that chapter, uh, Jesus had just foretold the destruction of the temple. And the disciples, when they were with Jesus by themselves, asked him, he says, when will these things be? When will this temple be destroyed? When shall you come back again? This is when we'll sign the sign of your coming. And when, when will the world end? And boy, everybody jumps on all these things that are in the 24th chapter and says all these things are signs of the second coming of Christ. If they are, they're double fulfilled prophecies. And because they've already been fulfilled at the destruction of Jerusalem and the overthrow of the temple. But what does he say about the end of the world, about his coming? Down in the 42nd verse, the 46th, uh, uh, 24th chapter, the 42nd verse. He says, watch therefore, for you know what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that the good men of a house have known, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? Whom his Lord that made rule over his house on the give them meat and busies. Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. What do what, what, what we need to be doing? Watch. I think we ought to pray. Uh, I think we ought to work. We ought to glorify his name. And we ought to be doing what God wants us to do. And I, I think it's time for us to think about. Uh, what is necessary. Acts the ninth chapter, first chapter. Acts the first chapter. Beginning with the ninth verse, Jesus met with the disciples after his resurrection. And he was talking to them, gave them the great commission to go into uh, that he may be their, his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. And as he spoke to them, he was taken up out of their sight. And they watched them. I think I would have been flabbergasted. I think I would have had my eyes wide open, my mouth would have probably dropped as I saw Christ ascending up into heaven. Levitation. And as he went up, the clouds received him out of his sight. And two men, angels in white apparel, stood by. Notice what it says in verses 9 through 11 of the first chapter of the book of Acts. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, say the night, a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked sad and steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. What these men are saying, Jesus is going to come back again. There's no doubt that the scriptures teach him that what he's saying, just don't stand looking into heaven. You have 
things that have to be done. Let's get them done. The last scripture that came to my mind was one of the most thrilling chapters in all of God's Word. All their questions come up as a result. And from the very first verse down to the very end verse, which is almost 58 verses. A thrilling chapter. I'd love to read it. Talking about the resurrection. Talking about a future hope. I, I, I look forward now to the time where, uh, where there will be no more pain, don't you? I, I look forward to the time where there will be no more sorrow. No more tears to shed. No more sickness. And that comes after the resurrection. But down at the end of this verse, as Paul concludes the teaching of the resurrection, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, talking about dying, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That this corruption must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, grave! O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, great, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I marvel at the victory that we have over both sin and death. And thus we have that victory over Satan himself. I marvel at that. We go on the 50th verse. Listen to this carefully. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast, unmovable, Stand firm upon the Word of God. Give your life over completely to His will. I marvel at the book of Revelation. Oh, I know there's a lot of interpretations and a lot of things are there. I think sometimes I even change my mind as to what a passage might mean. I'm horrible. I think as you look at that, you see the whole reign of the church. From its beginning on the day of Pentecost to its end to the coming of Christ. And I speak in the, I, I really believe that it's speaking of the church age, not some future age, as we're talking about that. Then at the very end, after John, the beloved disciple, has seen all these things, all the battles that were fought, all, all the tragedies that occurred, all the warfare, all the struggles, and everything that took place uh, through every chapter of this particular book. At the very end, we see the Lord saying, Behold, I come quickly. And I marvel at John's response. When Jesus said, Even so I come quickly, talking about the fact that he's going to come, it's a thief in the light, it's going to be quick. No one's going to know when. 
God says, even so, Lord Jesus. Come. If you look around the world today, the world is not a very decent place. Uh, I, I, my prayer goes, the prayer goes out to the church in Texas where they're, they're first time they meet after 20 some members of their church were shot and killed. And I see a contradiction in the news media here because I've heard several reporters make a comment that even one of the ones that were killed was an unborn baby. If that same report would set for abortion, I, I, that doesn't make my mind clear. I, I, I'm a, I worry about them. They're no longer going to be in that particular building because of the memories that are there. They're going to build a new building. And I don't blame them. I don't blame them. I, I, I wonder what's taking place when you find a person just driving up a bicycle path and killing as many people. What kind of a world do we have? Even so, when Jesus come. No. I think it's necessary for Jesus to come. For we as Christians have shared in his humiliation when he humbled himself and went to the cross. We have shared in that victory. And I think it is his design that we will share in his glory when he does come. I am ready. I am ready, are you? Have you given yourself all the way to Jesus? Have you been baptized into Jesus Christ? We're offering an invitation. Just as you are. I'm sure Mike would not mind taking you right now down into the baptistry and baptizing you for your shoes. Do you believe? I'm sure you do. Are you willing to repent?